My offerings are not for the temple at the end of the road, but for the wayside shrines that surprise me at every bend. Looking back on childhood's days, the thing that recurs most often is the mystery which used to fill both life and world. Something undreamt of was lurking everywhere, and the uppermost question every day was, when, oh when would we come across it? Our days were spent in the servants' quarters in the southeast corner of the outer apartments. One of our servants was Sham, a dark chubby boy with curly locks, hailing from the district of Khulna. He would put me into a selected spot and, tracing a chalk line all round, warn me with solemn face and uplifted finger of the perils of transgressing this ring. Whether the threatened danger was material or spiritual, I never fully understood but a great fear used to possess me. I had read in the Ramayana of the tribulations of Sita for having left the ring drawn by Lakshman, so it was not possible for me to be skeptical of its potency. No guests had come to my house for long. My doors were locked, my windows barred. I thought my night would be lonely. When I opened my eyes, I found the darkness had vanished. I rose up and ran, and saw the bolts of my gates all broken, and through the open door your wind and light waved their banner. When I was a prisoner in my own house, and the doors were shut, my heart ever planned to escape and to wander. Now at my broken gate, I sit still and wait for your coming. You keep me bound by my freedom. Beyond my reach, there was this limitless thing called the outside, of which flashes and sounds and scents used momentarily to come and touch me through its interstices. I had started a class of my own in a corner of our veranda. The wooden bars of the railings were my pupils, and I would act the schoolmaster, cane in hand, seated on a chair in front of them. I had decided which were the good boys and which the bad. Nay, further, I could distinguish clearly the quiet from the naughty, the clever from the stupid. The bad rails had suffered so much from my constant caning that they must have longed to give up the ghost had they been alive. And the more scarred they got with my strokes, the worse they angered me, till I knew not how to punish them enough. None remain to bear witness today how tremendously I tyrannized over that poor, dumb class of mine. My wooden pupils have since been replaced by cast iron railings, nor have any of the new generation taken up their education in the same way. They could never have made the same impression. Man belongs to two worlds one of which lies within him and the other outside. They give him life, health and strength and keep him ever flowing by ceaselessly breaking upon him in waves of form, color and smell, movement and music, and love and joy. Our children are banished from both these worlds, as from two native lands, and are kept chained in a foreign prison. The tame bird was in the cage, the free bird in the forest. They met when the time came. It was a decree of fate. The free bird cries, Oh, my love, let us fly to the wood. The cage bird whispers, Come hither, let us both live in the cage. Says the free bird, Among bars, where is there room to spread one's wings? Alas! cries the cage bird. I should not know where to sit perched in the sky. 
the free bird cries, My darling, sing the songs of the woodlands. The cage bird says, Sit by my side, I'll teach you the speech of the learned. The forest bird cries, No, ah no, songs can never be taught. The cage bird says, Alas for me, I know not the songs of the woodlands. Their love is intense with longing, but they never can fly wing to wing. Through the bars of the cage they look, and vain is their wish to know each other. They flutter their wings in yearning and sing, Come closer, my love. The free bird cries, It cannot be, I fear the closed doors of the cage. The cage bird whispers, Alas, my wings are powerless and dead. I was one day summoned upstairs to my father. How would I like to go with him to the Himalayas? I was asked. Away from the Bengal Academy and off to the Himalayas. Would I like it? Oh, that I could have rent the skies with a shout. That might have given some idea of the how. Our first halt was to be for a few days at Bolpur. In the pale early morning light, I sat at the window and looked out at the rushing world. The train was running ceaselessly. The train sped on. The broad fields with their blue-green border trees and the villages nestling in their shade flew past in a stream of pictures which melted away like a flood of mirages. It was evening when we reached Bolpur. There was no servant rule here, and the only ring which encircled me was the blue of the horizon, which the presiding goddess of these solitudes had drawn round them. Within this, I was free to move about as I chose. From this region, I would gather in the lap of my tunic many curious pieces of stone and take the collection to my father. He never made light of my labors. On the contrary, he waxed enthusiastic. How wonderful, he exclaimed. Wherever did you get all these? There are many, many more, thousands and thousands, I burst out. I could bring as many every day. That would be nice, he replied. Why not decorate my little hill with them? On the top of this height, my father used to sit for his morning prayer. And as he sat, the sun would rise at the edge of the undulating expanse which stretched away to the eastern horizon in front of him. of the Ganges welcomed me into its lap like a friend of a former birth. There, in front of the servants' quarters, was a grove of guava trees, and, sitting in the veranda under the shade of these, gazing at the flowing current through the gaps between their trunks, my days would pass. Every morning, as I awoke, I somehow felt the day coming to me like a new gilt-edged letter, with some unheard-of news awaiting me on the opening of the envelope. Every day there was the ebb and flow of the tide on the Ganges, the various gait of so many different boats. 
the shifting of the shadows of the trees from west to east, and over the fringe of shade patches of the woods on the opposite bank, the gush of golden lifeblood through the pierced breast of the evening sky. How small is this earth and confined, watched and followed by the persistent horizons. The trees, houses and crowd of things are pressing upon my eyes. light like a cage has shut out the dark eternity and the hours hop and cry within its barriers like prison birds. But why are these noisy men rushing on and for what purpose? They seem always afraid of missing something, the something that never comes to their hands. One morning I happened to be standing on the veranda looking that way. The sun was just rising through the leafy tops of those trees. As I continued to gaze, all of a sudden a covering seemed to fall away from my eyes and I found the world bathed in a wonderful radiance with waves of beauty and joy swelling on every side. This radiance pierced in a moment through the folds of sadness and despondency which had accumulated over my heart and flooded it with this universal light. That very day the poem, The Awakening of the Waterfall, gushed forth and coursed on like a veritable cascade. The poem came to an end, but the curtain did not fall upon the joy aspect of the universe. Ajiye prabhate robir kaur, kyamone poshilo praned paur, kyamone poshilo guhar adhare prabhat pakir gaan, na jani kyano re ato din pare jagiya uchilo praan, jagiya uthe che praan, ore utholi uthe che bari, ore praaner basho na praaner abeg rudhiya rakhi te nadi. थर थर करी का बुधर शिला राशि राशि पड़े खसे फुलिया फुलिया फिल सल गरजी उठे दारूण रसे हेथाय हेथाय पागल प्राय घूरिया घूरिया मातिया बेड़ा बाहर चाय देखते ना पाए कथाय कार दार 
প্রভাতের যেন লইতে কাড়িয়া আকাশের যেন ফেলিতে ছিঁড়িয়া উঠে শূন্য পানে পড়ে আছড়িয়া করে শেষে হাহাকার প্রাণের উল্লাসে ছুটিতে চায় ভুধরের হিয়া টুটিতে চায় আলিঙ্গন্তরে ঊর্ধ্বে বাহু তুলি আকাশের পানে উঠিতে চায় প্রভাত কিরণে পাগল হইয়া জগৎ মাঝারে লুটিতে চায় কেন রে বিধাতা পাশান হেন চারিদিকে তার বাঁধন কেন ভাঙরে হৃদয় ভাঙরে বাঁধন সাদরে আজিকে প্রাণের সাধন লহরির পরে লহরি তুলিয়া আঘাতের পরে আঘাত কর মাতিয়া যখন উঠেছে পড়ান কিসের আধার কিসের পাঠান উঠলি যখন উঠেছে বাসনা জগতে তখন কিসের দর But another current flowed in my mind. Living in the village of Silaidaha and Patisar, I had made my first direct contact with rural life. Zamindari was then my calling. My forefathers were among the earliest inhabitants of Calcutta and my childhood years felt no touch of the village. The everyday tasks of village folk and the varied cycle of their work filled me with wonder. Bred in the city, I stepped right into the heart of rural charm and filled myself with it. Then, slowly, the poverty and misery of the people grew vivid before my eyes and I began to wish that I could do something for them. I was struck with shame that I was a zamindar, impelled by the money motive, absorbed in revenue returns. Do not mock me. Tell me what has happened. Nothing. It is merely hunger. The vulgar hunger of poverty. The famished horde of barbarians is rudely clamoring, making the drowsy cuckoos in your royal garden start up in fear. Tell me, father, who are hungry? It is their ill fate. The king's poor subjects have been practicing long to live upon half a meal a day, but they have not yet become experts in complete starvation. It is amazing. But, father, the lad is smiling with ripe corn. Why should the king's subjects die of hunger? The corn is his, whose is the land. It is not for the poor. They, like intruding dogs at the king's feast, crouch in the corner for their crumbs or cakes. The great masses of our people live in villages. When the village wants to feel the throb of the greater life of the outside world, the fair is the best way. These fairs are most natural to our country. When our people are called to a formal meeting, they come burdened with doubt and suspicion and do not readily open their hearts. But those who assemble at a fair come with hearts already open. Plough and hoe left behind, they are on holiday.
accept these flowers, goddess, and let your creatures live in peace. Mother, those who are weak in this world are so helpless, and those who are strong are so cruel. Greed is pitiless, ignorance blind, and pride takes no heed when it crushes the small under its foot. Mother, do not raise your sword and lick your lips for blood. Then come and learn your lesson once again from me. Sin has no meaning in reality. To kill is but to kill. It is neither sin nor anything else. Do you not know that the dust of this earth is made of countless killings? Old time is ever writing the chronicle of the transient life of creatures in letters of blood. Killing is in the wilderness, in the habitations of man, in birds' nests, in insects' holes, in the sea, in the sky. There is killing for life, for sport, for nothing whatever. The world is ceaselessly killing. As the brutality of post-war Europe spreads the world over, we ask ourselves, where is that supreme tribunal of man to which the victims of outrage could make their final appeal? Are we to give up our faith in humanity? Must barbarism be answered with barbarism? The king at the end of his days is merged in the shadow of a nameless night among the unremembered leaving his salutation in an imperishable rhythm of stone, which ever cries, Let Buddha be my refuge. today has no peace. His heart arid with pride. He clamors for an ever-increasing speed and a fury of chase for objects that ceaselessly run but never reach a meaning. And now is the time when he must come groping at last to the sacred silence which stands still in the midst of surging centuries of noise till he feels assured that in an immeasurable love dwells the final meaning of freedom, whose prayer is, let Buddha be my refuge. Today I complete 80 years of my life. As I turn back to the long stretch of years behind me and view them in clearer perspective, I am struck by the change that has taken place in my attitude and in the psychology of my countrymen. A change that is tragic. I look back on the stretch of past years and see the crumbling ruins of a proud civilization lying heaped as garbage out of history and yet I shall not commit the grievous sin of losing faith in man, accepting his present defeat as final. I shall look forward to a turning in history after the cataclysm is over and the sky is again unburdened and passionless. Who are you, reader, reading my poems a hundred years hence? 
I cannot send you one single flower from this wealth of the spring, one single streak of gold from yonder clouds. Open your doors and look abroad. From your blossoming garden, gather fragrant memories of the vanished flowers of a hundred years before. In the joy of your heart, may you feel the living joy that sang one spring morning, sending its glad voice across a hundred years. Once I thought the path was mine alone, all of it mine. Now I see I was summoned to tread it once and no more.